Thanks, Ken. Um, I, I don't think Ken should be allowed to get out of the room without uh, my recognizing that he is, uh, was announced today as the recipient of the Engelmore Award for Contributions in Artificial Intelligence. And I'm uh, it's a very big deal in that field, possibly the biggest deal. And um, I'm very proud to have you on our NASA Advisory Council. Thanks for taking the time to do it for us. So, um, I'm often, uh, it's often remarked on that uh, uh, one of my characteristics is a certain candor, that's the nice phrase, bluntness is, is <laughs> the other phrase. And it's, it's remarked on as, um, as if I had a choice. Uh, I, I don't really know how to do any differently, so I hope I will be um, interesting tonight and that candor will not go over the line to bluntness, but I'll, I'll do my best. So I do want to thank, uh, I want to begin by thanking Ken for inviting me to be here tonight. Um, this institute is a truly unique group, tackles interdisciplinary issues of uh, science and engineering that help to extend mankind's reach on many frontiers, including ours. The uh, IHMC does a lot of work for NASA. And in fact, we at NASA deal with issues surrounding man-machine interfaces uh, literally every day. Whether it's flying the International Space Station with a crew of three astronauts on board trying to control uh, and operate what is today a three-quarter of a million pound space station, and when it's done, it will be a million pound space station. Um, or controlling more than 50 Earth and space science missions that are operating today in space, or developing new flight control algorithms and avionics for future aircraft, or building the next generation of space vehicles that we're working on today that will take Americans and our partners back to the moon, and then later on go even deeper into our solar system uh, to Mars. To carry out our mission, um, we have to understand the conditions that our machines will face and how they will behave under those conditions. Because mission success, and indeed the lives of our astronauts, depend upon our machines and the technical acumen of the scientists and engineers who develop and operate them. I thought it was appropriate tonight to speak tonight, uh, appropriate to speak tonight about the Hubble Space Telescope for a bit one of the greatest machines that NASA or anyone else has ever built, and about our relationship with that machine and what it has taught us and taught me uh, about our universe and, more importantly, ourselves. Now, this coming October, astronauts on board Space Shuttle Atlantis will rendezvous with Hubble to repair it and upgrade it for the fifth time in its nearly two decades of service. I think you all know that. It's hard to read a paper without knowing that we are going to do that. It was somewhat controversial at NASA when I came on board and I settled that controversy. Um, now, when they leave, um, it'll be better than ever. It will be better, in fact, than anyone ever imagined that it might be back when I was working on the Hubble project 25 years ago. We never imagined that it would be what it is today or what it is going to be after this fifth servicing mission. And the story of this scientific and engineering marvel is one of, of bold vision, vision and imagination and absolutely audacious risk-taking, but it's also a story of perseverance and ingenuity when, as sometimes happens, the risks that you take are not always successfully negotiated. It is a story that transcends science with Hubble images on display today in art museums or in homes where no scientist lives. But we all know that the images are far more than just a bunch of pretty pictures. Hubble has observed the birth and death of stars, not unlike our own solar system. It has shown the collision of the comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 
with the planet Jupiter, not unlike the asteroid collision 65 million years ago that wiped out the dinosaurs, which then roamed the Earth. It has peered through a tiny knothole in the night sky, deep into the early universe, finding thousands of galaxies where our own eyes would only see a patch of darkness. It has found that the galaxies in our universe are accelerating away from each other at a rate faster than any astrophysicist, including Edwin Hubble, ever predicted, allowing new insights into the birth and eventual fate of our universe while raising new mysteries about dark matter and dark energy, constituents of a universe that, in all humility, astrophysicists today must admit that we barely understand. Hubble has become a cultural icon while at the same time remaining an instrument of fundamental scientific discovery. It is unique in human history in its ability to occupy a place of prominence in both art museums and scientific journals. The birth of the Hubble Space Telescope and its launch in April 1990 would not have caused anyone to envision this outcome. Indeed, Hubble's first images were un unaccountably blurry. An analysis of its optical system revealed that a 2.3 micron error had been introduced in the grinding of its 2.4 meter primary mirror. Now the width of an average human hair is about 80 microns. So the error was almost unimaginably small. But as many of you in this audience will understand because of your own professional backgrounds, it's a huge error in terms of the optical wavelengths that a telescope must manipulate if it is to function at all. So this mistake was devastating to the astronomical community. It was equally devastating to NASA's credibility. NASA was the brunt of jokes on late night talk shows with the Hubble being compared to the Titanic, the Hindenburg, and the Edsel. I see that most of you are old enough as I am to remember the Edsel. Now, I've said, in, in, uh, I remarked once in a previous speech that we in the space business live by a creed of excellence or die without it. And that has happened. And with the Hubble, we faced a situation where this small error left unchecked called into question our ability to live by that creed. The jokes were cruel, leveling charges that NASA no longer had the right stuff in Tom Wolfe's elegant and memorable phrase. While such talk unfairly denigrates the many dedicated engineers and scientists and technicians who work late into the night to maintain the high standard of almost all our endeavors, even the slightest error on such a highly visible project calls into question what happened and, above all else, who was to blame. So as a, an aside for a moment, maybe this Institute of Human Cognition, Human and Machine Cognition, should study this especially human trait the tendency to kick those who are down. <laughs> For me, it always calls to mind President Theodore Roosevelt's great speech, Citizenship in a Republic. You should Google it. With its famous excerpt about the man in the arena. Few of those offering criticism of the Hubble mistake were capable of understanding its nature or origin, or indeed anything else of how the Hubble was designed or of the exacting tolerances to which it had to be built, or of the trade-offs that engineers face when deciding how to allocate scarce resources to multiple competing concerns. As someone who has served on numerous failure boards and has had to lead teams out of despair, I can only say that criticism from those who are both inept and uninvolved serves no useful function. <laughs> Maybe that was blunt. <laughs> it cannot even make us feel worse about ourselves than we already do when we have failed. But it does seem to be a constant companion of bold endeavors. It is the dark side of human progress. A long career in the space business with way too many opportunities to observe this behavior has caused me to come to the belief that there is, or at least should be, such a thing as earning the right to hold an opinion. But I digress. In the aftermath of the Hubble debacle, some Washington policymakers called for an end to NASA altogether. But we don't cast aside human frailty when we venture into space. And wiser heads understood that reaching for the unknown requires the fortitude to deal with adversity. 
As President John Kennedy warned the Congress and our nation in May of 1961, when, with 15 minutes of human spaceflight to our credit, he set forth the challenge to go to the moon and said, if we are to go only halfway or reduce our sights in the face of difficulty, in my judgment, it would be better not to go at all. So the Hubble scientists and engineers set their sights on fixing the telescope. The first step was to characterize precisely the observed error in the primary mirror and then craft a corrective lens for the aberration. The crew of the first servicing mission to Hubble trained intensively for one of the most complex shuttle missions ever undertaken, involving five spacewalks and over a hundred specialized tools to correct the optics, while also installing new solar arrays, gyroscopes, and other electrical components. They also upgraded the telescope with a new wide-field planetary camera. Now you all know today that this first shuttle mission to service the Hubble, as well as the three which followed, were huge successes. So today, the Hubble dazzles us with the splendor of our universe. But during those grim years between 1990 and 93, this awe-inspiring success was far from certain. If you didn't know the core strength of the NASA team when the chips are down, you might have bet against us, and you would have lost. And that is why, to me, the most meaningful lesson from the Hubble Space Telescope has more to do with our human nature than with the other secrets of the universe. That is, in the face of adversity, we must resolve to persevere. To that end, I know, because I see it every day, that NASA still has the right stuff. So I think I should take a moment to acknowledge those who have and who will risk their lives to make the Hubble Space Telescope such a success. Every astronaut I know who has been on a Hubble mission, and many who haven't, has a special place in his or her heart for that machine. They believe it to be a part of something greater than themselves, something that, for which the risk of their lives is worth the promise of unlocking the secrets of our universe for future generations. Dave LaCrone, the Hubble program senior scientist and a former co coworker of mine, once said, we are privileged to be the first generation of Homo sapiens to, gather, to gain a clear and deep view of the visible universe. And what we see out there is staggering in its beauty, awesome in its scale, and shocking in the way that it has upended our preconceived notions about how nature works. You don't have to be a scientist to grasp it. Any thinking person who has come in contact with Hubble images and Hubble discoveries seems to find exhilaration in the notion that our place in the grand scheme of things is now better defined than in all prior human history. Dave is so right. And yet his comment makes a great preface to an observation I now want to make. It might set you back a bit. Science is not everything we do at NASA, nor should it be. And while the advancement of science is of fundamental importance at NASA, and scientific discovery has a key role in human spaceflight, it is not the most compelling reason to do it. I'd like to take a little time to explain why I believe this to be so, because numerous critics have called into question the cost and risk of journeys into space to the moon, Mars, the near-Earth asteroids, or the construction of the International Space Station, which we're using as a tool to learn how to sustain such journeys. So let me try and provide some food for thought for you tonight. Some of you will disagree with me, and thus spark maybe a worthwhile debate. I never learn anything by talking to people who agree with me. <laughs> to me, NASA's manned missions to the Hubble Space Telescope are qualitatively different from other human spaceflight endeavors. The difference is fundamental, and it's important. While our other efforts may not seem today to be as noble or worthwhile as servicing the Hubble, they are in the long run more important to the future of the human race. I'd like to try and explain why I believe this is so. To survive off-planet in a different environment, having different natural resources than those we have come to understand and take for granted, without the ability to drive to the nearest supermarket or doctor's office, is a qualitatively different experience than a brief foray into low Earth orbit. Not many realize it, but NASA and our international partners, 15 other nations, have maintained a permanent human foothold in space on board the International Space Station since October of 2000. The hard lessons of living and working in outer space 24-7, 365 
are much different than those of an intense two-week campaign to serve as a scientific instrument like the Hubble, or to deploy a mission to Jupiter like Galileo, or the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, or to conduct other research, as, as has been done on, on many individual shuttle missions. So when we begin our halting steps back to the moon in the next decade, or a journey to Mars in 20 or 25 years, we will need to know what we must bring with us, but also how we might live off the land with the resources available to us when we arrive. And after we test the hypothesis that we can survive on other worlds, we then need to determine whether such outposts can become economically viable, meaning is there anything to do there which is worth the investment to do it? Now many today will assert without benefit of proof that the answer is of course yes, while others believe that the answer is of course no. In my own opinion, no one can t today can know the answer. The answer can be found only by experiment. So in that sense, the purpose of today's human spaceflight program is to conduct such experiments, to explore and develop options, and to unveil possibilities for future generations. Now this experiment will be conducted in space over the course of the coming centuries by people from Earth. Only the language, culture, and motives of the experimenters remain to be determined. I hope that this experiment will always find Americans, in company with our international partners and allies, as first among equals on the frontier of their time. The experiment will not be dissimilar to those conducted by our ancestors far removed in space and time when they left East Africa looking for an easier existence somewhere else. It will not be dissimilar to that conducted by our more immediate ancestors just a few centuries ago when they began to explore and settle what to Europeans was the new world. In that context, I might note that it required the long-term investment of kingdoms, governments, commercial industry, and private citizens for many generations before I think it could honestly be said that the new world provided a positive return on investment for society at large. On a smaller scale, our experiments in space will not be dissimilar to that conducted by Thomas Jefferson when he risked impeachment to consummate the Louisiana Purchase and then sought congressional financing marvelous chutzpah, <laughs> for what became the Lewis and Clark expedition 200 years ago. And by the way, Lewis and Clark overran their budget, lost a considerable amount of their equipment, fell so far behind schedule that they were given up for dead, <laughs> and failed to achieve their primary goal, which was to find a suitable water route from the headwaters of the Missouri River to the Pacific Ocean. Now, does anybody here think that their effort was wasted? <laughs> Venturing into space is similarly an experiment, but one eminently worth conducting for several reasons. First, I strongly believe that there will be near-term benefits to science, technology, economics, and national security as we begin to incorporate the solar system into our sphere of influence, as science advisor Jack Marburger framed the issue a few years ago in a, in a speech that I particularly liked. Now, I, I don't believe I need to dwell for this audience upon the benefits to human society of scientific advances. I'll say a few words. We were on the verge of developing a new paradigm, a new view of how the universe is constructed. The last time, a century ago, that such an experience was forced upon us was accomplished through the work of Albert Einstein and his elucidation of relativity and quantum mechanics. Today, these disciplines underpin much of modern technology and they form the backdrop of physics against which new ideas are interpreted. What will be the implications of forming new theories to embrace the experimental finding that 96% of the mass energy of our universe is comprised of dark energy and dark matter, things we don't even pretend to understand? Everything you can see and feel around you is 4% of what exists. And until a few years ago, we didn't know anything about the other 96%. Regarding technology, what is the benefit to a society which learns how to do what no one else has ever done? No human activity is more demanding across a broader range of disciplines than space exploration, nor is there any which produces greater returns from its mastery. Two generations and more ago, in what I consider to be the best speech he ever gave, President Kennedy said, quote, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills." And he went on. 
Now, as a nation, we're still reaping the benefits of the Apollo investment, but they're coming to an end. America is no longer supreme in the world marketplace, not even in aerospace. It is time to move the goalposts, to define some new hard things, and to move outward again for precisely the reasons President Kennedy articulated so long ago. I also believe that a vigorous civil, civil space program offers collateral benefits to national security. When I've spoken of this in the past, it has usually elicited some amount of surprise. But I think those who are surprised take too narrow a view of national security. For the last century, the United States has been a world power, even if at times we didn't aspire to it or even recognize it. And as such, we have assumed certain responsibilities for leadership on the world stage. In that capacity, it is inevitable that we have been and will again be called upon to make decisions and take actions that displease other nations and societies. We can't please everyone, and we can't retire from world affairs. So if that's true, it is equally true that we cannot prosper if every hand is against us. If we must do hard things, it behooves us also to undertake activities which easily attract allies and partners, things which bind others to us in the world community. And no activity has shown itself to be of greater interest, greater inherent interest and excitement to others than the exploration and development. of being a nation, a society, which leads the world in an endeavor which excites all others, one in which every nation that can do so seeks to partner with us. These are some of the specific benefits I see accruing to the nation which leads in the exploration of space. But I also believe that in the long term it will be important for the survival of the human race to inhabit planets other than the Earth. It will be in our interest to develop the technical capabilities to avoid the many cosmic collisions that we have now documented in the geological record. The comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, which struck Jupiter a few years back, consisted of at least 21 discernible fragments having diameters up to two kilometers. Even one such collision with the Earth would be devastating, and it doesn't have to be a dinosaur killer. An impact like the Tunguska event of 1908 could destroy the cultural and economic fabric of a nation if it were to land in a populated area instead of the Siberian wilderness. So I believe that the long-term survival, scientific discovery, economic benefit, and recognized leadership in great endeavors provide a worthwhile rationale for sustaining our nation's human spaceflight efforts. This and our endeavors in robotic science, uh, Earth and space science, and our work in advanced aeronautics are purchased with an investment in NASA of six-tenths of one percent of the federal budget. Six-tenths of a percent, about 15 cents a day. I spent more than that today on bubble gum, actually. <laughs> I dropped 50 cents in a bubble gum machine when I was refueling my airplane on the way down here. So that was uh, several days' worth of my contribution to NASA. Now, if any of you happen to be average Americans, this figure will surprise you because polls reveal that the 50 percentile American, the average American, believes that NASA receives over 24 percent of the federal budget. <laughs> that would be comparable to the Department of Defense. Um, so just, just so you know. Now, my view is that our efforts in human spaceflight are, in actuality, far more meaningful than the flags and footprints rationale with which some critics of human spaceflight like to denigrate the Apollo program or future voyages to the moon and Mars. In my view, survival and leadership in great enterprises and economic benefit are real and acceptable reasons why humans should continue to explore space beyond what robotic spacecraft can achieve. Throughout mankind's time on this world, we have gazed up at the night sky and attempted to make sense of the stars and planets and comets and asteroids, speculating about what it all might mean. We are lucky enough to be the first generation to see the universe with the clarity that the Hubble offers. <clears throat> and I firmly believe that, we believe that we also need to journey beyond, as uh, the poet John Gillespie McGee put it, the surly bonds of Earth in order to see the universe with our own eyes. And in the words of poet T.S. Eliot, 
Only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. I believe that expanding the range and scope of human action is a goal fully as noble as that of scientific discovery. I also think that in our hearts we know these things. We know that space is the frontier of tomorrow and that the frontier can only be ours with boots on the ground. We know from even the most casual reading of history that nations that shrink from the frontiers of their time shrink also in their influence on the world stage. We know these things, and yet we also see that Americans today do not feel the urgency for preeminence on the space frontier that we felt in the 50s and 60s. Sometimes I wonder if we're a bit tired or distracted from other urgent crises to recognize what that preeminence means for America. And so I am reminded of Edgar Allan Poe's gallant knight in search of El Dorado, and who, in his fatigue, asks a pilgrim shadow where it might be. Over the mountains of the moon, down the valley of the shadow, ride, boldly ride, the shade replied, if you seek for El Dorado. Sometimes there is just no rest for the weary. Thank you very much. I told Ken I would finish in not more than 25 minutes, and I did, so my, my first achievement has been accomplished. I think we are going to now spend pretty much most of an hour taking questions. Uh, on the front row here, sir. And, and I'll try to move around the room. That will keep the microphone lady jumping, but... Uh. Harold Loesch, scientist. Um, we hear a lot about UFOs. Some people are saying they're from outer space, and I think that's rather ridiculous. I think it's impossible. Uh, what is your opinion on that? Well, we used to keep all of our aliens in Area 51, but uh, <laughs> the, 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 all the notoriety in the press was uh, causing so much foot traffic through the area that, that they, were, they weren't able to get their work done, and so we had to move them to a new location. No, I, I, there's, I, I have no evidence at all uh, that I have ever seen or has ever been presented to me to say that, I mean, there are unidentified flying objects, which literally means we can't identify them. But I, I have no evidence that they're from... space, yeah, but not from human, Right. Right. Sir, uh, right behind the lady with the microphone. My name is Jack Dunn. I spent 10 years of my life working on the Hubble for Lockheed Missiles and Space Company. It's a gift that keeps on giving. And thank God you, not your predecessor, is making decisions about keeping it alive. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I you know, my, my predecessor made the decision he made in the time period right after the loss of Columbia, and I think it was very understandable why that decision was taken as it was. And uh, I, I was very clear at the time that we announced that we would do a, a Hubble servicing mission, that it had taken us 18 months of hard work to figure out a way to be certain that we could do it without unduly risking another astronaut crew. Because in the Hubble orbit, they don't have the opportunity to go to the station if something goes wrong with the shuttle. And so it, it, we, we worked very hard to, to remove some risk. So while I can understand that the, why the prior decision was, was done, um, I am glad that, that we, pushed, we pushed hard on it. So uh, perseverance again. Sir. Thank you. Uh, you hear a lot in, generally in government about the demographics of so many people, uh, if you don't mind me saying so, you know, your age, who might be uh, at, some 50, point, at some point this year. <laughs> at some point in time uh, leaving NASA? Is there a, uh, in your view, uh, troops, if you will, in their twenties, thirties, and forties who have the same uh, same uh, gumption that you had at that point? Well, I think the thing you want to do is is uh, recognize that 
uh, the, the Democrat, the gentleman is making the point that the demographics of the aerospace industry, because of the Apollo and defense buildup in, in the 60s, 50s, 60s, early 70s, um, uh, brought a lot of young people into the business back then. And then there, we aerospace went through the doldrums in the 70s and 80s, and then it came back up again. And so we have a kind of a classic double hump curve of, of do we have a good number of young people and a good number of old people and not a lot in the middle. Um, and so within the next five or six years, a very large number of us will be you know, retiring from, from the space business. Uh, it's a challenge and an opportunity. The challenge is that, that an awful lot of what makes things work can't be written down in books. Um, I wrote a book. <laughs> I, I know that you can't write it all down in a book. And so that is the kind of lore which is passed on from you know, master to apprentice. Uh, and so when the older folks retire, the opportunity to pass that knowledge on is, is lost. And so we need to make sure that we do the best job of it we can, we can while we can. At the same time, I'm in awe of the kids coming out of school today. I mean, they come out knowing stuff that you know, I, I haven't yet learned, or if I knew it, it took me years to get to it. Um, and and that's, that's what we call progress. Uh, I mean, we want that to be the case. I don't want to be able to make any other statement than the fact that I'm in awe of the young kids coming out of school today. Uh, I, I was commenting not too long ago to somebody that, you know, I, I did one of the early PhD theses in what we call computational fluid dynamics, and Fifteen years later, I assigned essentially that problem as a homework problem, uh, <laughs> which is embarrassing, <laughs> except for the fact that if you look at it the right way, that's the kind of thing you want to be able to say came true, that something that was once at the state of the art is now a homework problem. And so, I mean, that's what we want. So. Uh, when we lose a lot of older folks from the space business, we will lose a lot of knowledge, but we'll also gain an opportunity to bring a lot of bright young kids on. And boy, I tell you, when I talk to them, the, the, these young men and women are just gung-ho. So I, I'm thrilled with the opportunity. We've got a great future ahead of us as long as we do good things. Sir. And then over there on the right you so you can start walking. Thank you for coming to Pensacola. Welcome. Well, you're welcome. About four months ago, Ben Stein released this uh, documentary concerning Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. And it showed in a remarkable fashion the disdain and contempt many remarkably brilliant scientists had for intelligent design or even the mention of God in study. Now that we know that 96% of the universe is matter or just raw energy, which could be God or source, do you think there's a possibility that what you're doing with, with future space exploration and future academic advancement will make science more God-friendly or spirit-friendly? Uh, I don't know, sir. Um, I know, I know, I mean, I just don't know. I know many scientists... <laughs> I know many scientists who are deeply religious, many engineers who are deeply religious, uh, and I know many others who are not. And, you know, whenever I get these kinds of, of uh, questions or topics, I mean, they're deeply engaging. But the thing that I draw from it is I I'm glad we live in a place where people are entitled to have different opinions on things like that and not go to war with one another over it. Because I don't think any of us knows the answer, or at least I'm sure I don't know the answer. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes, sir. Well, thanks for coming to the cradle of naval aviation, Pensacola, Florida. And um, that's my, coming from a privilege. retired Air Force fighter pilot. Uh, um, my question for you is, I'm concerned about our reliance on GPS and the vulnerability of that system to the world we live in now. It's a very soft target, and we become more and more dependent on that, and there's relatively no defense for it. Well, you're right. Uh, we are dependent on it. GPS, global, global satellite navigation, has become a public utility. And, I mean, it, it, it has. I mean, people expect to be able to find their way uh, just as they expect to be able to plug a power cord into a wall socket and get power out of it. Um, and you're right, it's vulnerable. Um, 
You know, I, I've done a lot of time in, in defense space, and, and I may do it again, um, but right now I'm running the civil space program, and NASA's not involved in those issues, and I, I really need to keep a boundary between defense space and civil space so that I'm sort of staying in my own swim lane. And, and so other, other than agreeing with your point that we really need GPS in today's world and that it is, it is obviously a target, if somebody wants to make it a target, I, I should probably just stop there. Thanks, though. Well, I mean, I run the civil space program, you know. When, <laughs> in another incarnation, who knows? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. I'm Victoria Glass from Pensacola High School, and my question for you is, um, this summer I visited the Air Force Research Laboratory Starfire Optical Range mm -hmm. out at Kirkland Air Force Base. Yeah, I used they, to fund that when I was doing defense space. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they had mentioned about how the Hubble telescope was made to avoid the atmospheric turbulence with pictures, and I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about that for about, my science fair project. You mean atmospheric turbulence or, uh, or correcting for it with the Starfire optical range. Whatever you think would be best. <laughs> this is one of those where you really have to be careful. You might get more answer than you wanted. Um, the Hubble, uh, the, the Hubble Space Telescope was um, uh, an, an idea surfaced by uh, John Bacall back in the late 1940s, or actually around the time I was born, because once it became po once it became clear that it was going to be possible to put orbiting satellites up above the Earth's atmosphere, um, and the development by Germany in World War II of the V2 rocket caused knowledgeable people to realize that that was something that would only be a few years away. Um, people started speculating on what they could do with such a capability, and one and astronomers, of course, at that time and even today, were hugely hampered by the Earth's atmosphere. First of all, it absorbs a number of wavelengths of light. You can't see through the atmosphere in the infrared. You can't see through it in the ultraviolet. Um, you can't see through it in certain microwave regions, which inter with with water, which with which are absorbed by water vapor. So the Earth's atmosphere is, quote, transparent. It's transparent to our eyes because our eyes are adapted to being able to see through, see in the light that gets through the atmosphere. But it's, it's not very transparent. And even where it is transparent, um, it has what are called turbulent eddies in it. And those turbulent eddies, just like the, the heat waves rising from a hot sidewalk when you, or a road, when you look through it, it distorts the view behind it. So that messes things up for astronomers. So from the time they began thinking about satellites, they began thinking about the advantages that would accrue to putting a telescope either on the moon or, or in orbit. Um, that vision was finally realized when the Hubble was put up. Um, and because it's above the atmosphere, it gets above the atmospheric turbulence and allows us to see deep in space. Now, the downside is that it's really hard to put big things up in space. Um, it is rocket science, actually. <laughs> um, and so the Hubble is not the biggest telescope by far that's ever been put together. I mean, the, the Hale telescope out in California was put together in the late 40s and early 50s is, is twice as big. But it's the biggest telescope people could put up at, with the technology we had at the time, and it, it does allow us to see quite deep into the universe. So there are trade-offs. Now, in, in uh, more recent years, as, as back when I was with Strategic Defense Initiative, which created and you know, funded the Starfire Optical Range, people have worked out technical methods for correcting for the atmospheric aberration. With, with very precise lasers and, and things like that, and what we call deformable mirrors, it's possible um, by, say, shining a laser up, at, up through the air and then detecting the laser energy which backscatters from the upper atmosphere to measure the aberrations. 
because you know you sent up a perfectly pure laser beam and what you get back is crud. <laughs> so you can measure the crud and, cor and correct it. Now the second part of that is how do you correct it? Well, if you're going to correct it, you have to be able to alter the telescope's figure, the, mirror, the, the figure of the telescope mirror, to just exactly compensate for the atmospheric distortions. And you have to do that very, very, very quickly. However, today, our electronics, our processing capability with computers, and our ability to put together lots of tiny actuators on the backs of our mirrors and push or pull them in time with the aberrations which are being measured and, and the corrections computed allows us to make very large mirrors or, or segments of mirrors where we correct for the atmospheric aberration and then we can get the effect of one large mirror that's outside the atmosphere. So it is becoming possible to build telescopes on the ground with our, which are both large and not badly affected by atmospheric turbulence. However, nothing solves the problem of water vapor, lack of transparency in critical <coughs> wavelengths, um, and also dwell time. When the Hubble took the picture that I talk about, that what we call the Hubble deep field, looking through a particular spot uh, near the constellation Fornax, where there just don't happen to be any nearby stars. The Hubble dwelt on that for almost a, uh, two weeks of observing time, one orbit at a time, building up two weeks of observing time. You can't do that on the ground. I mean, once the Earth rotates out of, you know, you only have a fairly <laughs> narrow window that you can look up through the thin parts of the atmosphere and gather the light. So there will always be a place for ground-based telescopes, and for the foreseeable future, there will always be a place for space-based telescopes because they do different things. I'm sure that's way more answer than you wanted. <laughs> and I could give you more, but, uh, but, I'll, <laughs> but I'll have mercy. Um, another question. Uh, let's go to the back of the room. We haven't done anyone in the back, so there's a gentleman there and then the lady in purple next. Okay. Thank you I for think that, that is purple for right up now. Here today. Yeah. Did I have that right? <laughs> Thank yes, you for sir. showing up here today. Your time is certainly very appreciated. Uh, I have a question for you. You mentioned earlier uh, the migration to the new world, and I think that's really a great metaphor for the move to space. The thing that really fueled the migration to the new world was commerce and the ability of industry and commercial properties to develop something for the new world. So, <clears throat> excuse me, my question is, just from your experience, what do you see being for lack of a better term, the commercial hook, the thing which is going to make people say, okay, there's, there's as, as gross as it might be to say, there's money to be made in space. What, where do you see that happening? Well, see, I don't know. That's the point. Um, and neither did our ancestors of centuries ago know when they came here. Um, let, let me remind you of a couple of... of interesting facts that we study when we're kids in school and sort of forget. Um, the first cash crop to come out of the New World was tobacco from Virginia. Now, raise your hand if you think that tobacco has been the most important product to come out of the New World for Europeans. <laughs> so, I, I don't think... I don't think tobacco is the most important product to come out of the new world. Um, so we don't know ahead of time. Now, I'll, I'll make another point. When in, if, you, if you read in, um, I believe in Stephen Ambrose's Undaunted Courage, the story of the Lewis and Clark expedition, in the back you can read Jefferson's letter to Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, where he made the point that I made in the speech that one of their, their primary objective was to find a water route to the Pacific for the purpose of enabling the fur trade, which was huge. The trade in, in beaver pelts from the early 1800s through the, around 1840 was huge. Now, Jefferson was as smart a president as we will ever have, as smart a world leader as there has ever been. And, I mean, the country owes an enormous amount to Jefferson's leadership from the Declaration of Independence and, and, and onward. So this incredibly smart man couldn't see past the fur trade. I don't think I'm smarter than he was. And I don't think any of us are. 
So, so I retreat to the line I used in my speech. Our job is to push the frontier and develop options so that just as we are the beneficiary of the options created by generations past, future generations will be the benefit of the options we create, create for them. Would it be okay if I reword? Because I think I might have asked the question improperly. Um, certainly, we, there's no way to know what will be the benefit of going to space or, or what, 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 what benefits we may reap from it. I guess what I really meant to say is, are you, just being in the industry that you're in, are you seeing what is currently the quote-unquote fur trade, the thing that we think we're going after? That's what I really mean. What, the, thing we think we're, the things we think we're going after now are scientific knowledge, okay, um, that some of which can really only easily be enabled by human beings on site, as well as, again, creating the technology and the capability to go where no one has gone before, to create the options for, for being lucky. That's what we're purchasing now. It's, it, it's really where I need to, again, I need to draw a better analogy. I drew an analogy to the Western European voyages to and discovery of the new world. But that's not the right analogy. Where we are in the space business is more analogous to where we were when the first Western Europeans set sail on the ocean, the Vikings, around A.D. 1000. We're in the first 50 years of the space business. The, the great voyages of discovery occurred five and six centuries later. We're not there, you know. We're, we're in, you know, Viking longships leave what today is Scandinavia and some of them come back. <laughs> you know. Um, in, in purple, yes ma'am. Thank you for coming to our community and you've answered a lot of questions for me about some of the behaviors that I see here and especially like some of our trash that's being thrown on the side of the road, mirrors and such. My question is, when these behaviors, in a, in a philosophical sense, and as, far, as we move into artificial intelligence versus human behavior, where are we going to draw the line between inhumanity related to the artificial intelligence and try to rein the inhumanity in and not excuse it without a seatbelt for artificial intelligence? Um, Ma'am, I just don't have the background to answer your question. I'm sorry. I and can't answer that one. It, just a philosophical statement or question. And have you read the essay by Garrett Hardin, Living on a Lifeboat? Uh, no, ma'am, I have not. It, it, it's worth reading. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I really am just a simple aerospace engineer from a small town. <laughs> Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, okay, what, what is the future of NASA in terms of short term? How many more missions are planned to visit the space station? And when that program runs out, what will be the status of the space station, the International Space Station? Who's going to grab it? Who's going to run it? Who's going to be controlling it? Well, great question. Um, we have 10 more shuttle missions to complete... Uh, I mean, the, the, the backbone of work is behind us, but we have 10 more missions to finish constructing the station and to outfit it. Um, they will be done by the year 2010. At the end of that year, we will retire the shuttle. And then uh, we are now in the, in the business of crafting uh, replacements for the shuttle in terms of the ability to put people and, and cargo in orbit. Uh, those new systems, because of budget restrictions, won't be available until around 2015. So for a period of four and a half to five years, uh, we will be purchasing crew transport from Russia. We will be purchasing seats on Soyuz from Russia. Um, and we will be... Um, uh, our international partners, Europe and Japan, owe the program a certain amount of cargo transport, and they will, they will, they will meet their obligations on that, I'm, I'm certain. They're very good engineers. And we will be purchasing some cargo transport, hopefully, from U.S. firms. There's a, um, uh, a proposal out on the street, as we say right now, for um, uh, U.S. and other firms to um, 
offer bids on cargo transport. So crew from Russia, cargo from our partners, and cargo from U.S. commercial suppliers. Uh, we believe, uh, I'm tempted to say we hope, but hope is not a management tool. Uh, we believe that, that, that by pre-positioning um, important spares on the station with the shuttle before the, the shuttle retires, that we can make it through that five-year period with, with that strategy. It's not a strategy that anybody thinks is pretty or that anyone likes, um, but we just don't receive enough money to, in parallel with the flying out of the shuttle, also develop robustly a, a replacement system. We would need a, a funding bubble, and we don't have it. So there will be a gap in, in U.S. There will be a gap in U.S. access to space for for four and a half or five years. Um, for let's see, folks who haven't had one, uh, sir, right there. And then over in the white shirt over on this side of the room. Thank you for your comments tonight. Uh, uh, I remember as a child, much like most people in this room, uh, the excitement around the, uh, the uh, Apollo missions. Um, I read in, with further excitement about the return to the moon. Could I get your comments on, uh, on that mission? And um, I, I guess your, your, uh, your answer to some criticism that uh, sort of been there, done that, uh, 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 debate that uh, one can read. Uh, appreciate your comments on our, our uh, return to the moon. Well, um, we are returning to the moon. It will be in the next decade. Sometimes people say, why does it take so long? We did it in eight years the first time. Well, we're actually not going to take much more than eight years the second time. It's just that we really can't start until the station is done for the reasons of funding that I just address with this gentleman's question. I mean, we're doing things in series that were done in, par par in parallel during the Apollo years, uh, and that just takes more time. Um, with regard to uh, been there and done that, well, not really. When we return to the moon, and here's an analogy that I use a lot. Uh, human beings first made it to the South Pole in 1912. Uh, Norwegians uh, actually made it first. Um, then Admiral Byrd, you know, landed an airplane there you know, sometime in the 1930s, and that was interesting, but it wasn't very sustainable. And then nobody went again until the 1950s. And when they went in the 1950s, it was part of the International Geophysical Year uh, efforts, and people went back to Antarctica for scientific purposes, and, the, and they went to stay. And the Antarctic now has been continuously occupied on a multinational basis for 50 years. And, and the, the, the outposts in Antarctica that started with Quonset huts have grown, and, and now they really have the status of small towns. And people, you know, scientists and engineers, in many cases, will winter over. They live there uh, for extended tours of duty. We're going to be doing that at the moon. Um, in... 12 or 13 years, we'll have a small lunar outpost, and it will be capable of being permanently manned, and I think it will grow from there. So it's not been there, done that, and I believe that such an outpost will be sustained as long as it returns scientific value for the money. Um, even more than that, though, a lot of people say, well, we've been to the moon and we didn't find anything all that interesting. I mean, I, A, I disagree with that, but because I've found it to be quite interesting, but... Um, I, I, I get a particular chuckle out of that one. Our total human time on the moon consists of less than one man month. Um, with all the 12 people who have been there and the explorations they've conducted, their time on target was less than a man month. And the moon has a surface area the size of Africa. So you're going to a world, a separate world, the size of Africa, and, and you have one man month of total time, and you've now knowledgeable enough to know forever that it's not interesting? I mean, how does that work? I'm not that smart. Um, so, so I don't think been there and done that applies at all. Uh, now, many people will say Mars is much more interesting than the moon, even if the moon is interesting, let's go there. Well, actually, I agree. Mars is fantastically interesting. But if you want to go to Mars directly today, um, you need to be able to convince yourself you can do the following experiment. You need to be able to convince yourself that you can put a crew in a submarine 
weld the hatch shut, and send them on a three-year voyage around the world, and tell them not to come back anytime sooner than three years, and good luck. Dr drop, a, drop us a note and let us know how that works out. Um, we can't do that today, and we've been building submarines for 100 years. Okay. Um, three years into a Mars voyage, we need to know that when a crew opens a container of food, it will still be food and not garbage. We need to know that the machinery will still work, uh, that the humans can still work in the environment. Um, there's an awful lot about living and working in space that we just don't know. And so we're going to learn those things on the space station and on the surface of the moon where you're three days from home and not three years from home. And so I would say even if somebody, I don't agree, but even if somebody finds the moon to be an uninteresting place, at the very least, it's an engineering test bed for what we're going to have to know to go to, to, go to Mars. So We have time for two more questions. Over in the this side of the room. Yeah, Dr. Griffin, thank you for coming. Mike, I'm, I'm Mike. Please. Thanks, Mike. Uh, in regards to the previous comment about the uh, the budget shortfalls and things like that, is there any path to get funding from outside sources, say outside industries, you know, even places like Walmart, McDonald's, anybody like that could, that could be interesting? Anybody would be interesting in helping fund these missions and, and, and keep it going instead of relying strictly on tax dollars? Um. The activities of the of in in our system, uh, okay. I mean, Europeans and Japanese do it differently, but in our system, activities of the United States government are um, requested by the president and approved or not by the Congress, and they come from the public treasury. And if there are donations to the public treasury, they go to the treasury. It's very hard for private citizens or or companies, corporate citizens, to donate money to specific government activities because the Constitution empowers um, the Congress as the final arbiter of, of what it is that the U.S. government does. And so in, in our system, it's not easy at all to do what you suggest. There are some exceptions, but it's not at all easy. So uh, one more in the yellow uh, shirt, sir. Yes. I was just uh, wondering what you envisioned, or maybe you already have a good plan as far as the next type of vehicle replace a shuttle? Uh, for, for well, actually, yeah, we do have a good plan, or at least I think we do. Um, and this is what I do for a living. Um, it, it, it will look a lot to you when you, if you, you know, Google it and check, it will look a lot to you, we're calling it Orion. Um, it'll look a lot to you like an Apollo spacecraft. If you don't notice the fact that it's more than twice as big inside and, and carries six people instead of three and, and some things like that. It looks a lot like an Apollo spacecraft because it must be able to go to the moon and return. And then later it must be able to be a crew entry vehicle for coming home from Mars. Um, and when you're entering the atmosphere at high speed, there are only certain shapes that will work. Wing, wings don't cut it with the material technology that we, that we possess today as human beings. So it really kind of needs to look like a blunt body and you know, a, a number of different shapes could work, but the Apollo spacecraft shape was one of those, and we had a tremendous amount of data available on it. And I, I'm not one who believes in reinventing the wheel unnecessarily. So we adopted the Apollo shape of the 1960s and made it bigger so it could carry more stuff, but it's going to look a lot like that. Well, the second stage will be liquid-fueled, but the first stage will be actually a shuttle solid rocket booster, um, which, uh, although the shuttle solid rocket booster is today the most reliable piece of space transportation hardware in the world, with um, now over or approaching 200 successful uses in a row with no failures. Uh, now, the solid rocket boosters, of course, have a checker checkered history, because uh, on the 25th flight of the space shuttle, uh, one of those was um, uh, underwent a failure that, that cost us the Challenger crew and, and, uh, and seven astronauts. Um, uh, that was a tough day. The United States government has invested now seven lives and many billions of dollars in making that particular piece of hardware very reliable, and it is. And so um, I am using it in the forward-looking architecture uh, for for uh, replacing the shuttle. 
I think that has to be it for the evening. Thank you, uh, Ken, Thanks again. Thank you for having me. Thank, uh, I want to begin by thanking Ken for inviting me to be here tonight. Um, this institute is a truly unique group. It tackles interdisciplinary issues of uh, science and engineering that help to extend mankind's reach on many frontiers, including ours. The uh, IHMC does a lot of work for NASA. And in fact, we at NASA deal with issues surrounding man-machine interfaces uh, literally every day. Whether it's flying the International Space Station with a crew of three astronauts on board trying to control uh, and operate what is today a three-quarter of a million pound space station, and when it's done it will be a million pound space station, um, or controlling more than 50 Earth and space science missions that are operating today in space, or developing new flight control algorithms and avionics for future aircraft, or building the next generation of space vehicles that we're working on today that will take Americans and our partners back to the moon and then later on go even deeper into our solar system uh, to Mars. To carry out our mission, um, we have to understand the conditions that our machines will face and how they will behave under those conditions because mission success and indeed the lives of our astronauts depend upon our machines and the technical acumen of the scientists and engineers who develop and operate them. Really blurry. An analysis of its optical system revealed that a 2.3 micron error had been introduced in the grinding of its 2.4 meter primary mirror. Now the width of an average human hair is about 80 microns. So the error was almost unimaginably small. But as many of you in this audience will understand because of your own professional backgrounds, it's a huge error in terms of the optical wavelengths that a telescope must manipulate if it is to function at all. So this mistake was devastating to the astronomical community. It was equally devastating to NASA's credibility. NASA was the brunt of jokes on late night talk shows with the Hubble being compared to the Titanic, the Hindenburg, and the Edsel. <laughs> I see that most of you are old enough, as I am, to remember the Edsel. Now, I've said, in, in, uh, I remarked once in a previous speech, that we in the space business live by a creed of excellence or die without it. And that has happened. And with the Hubble, we faced a situation where this small error left unchecked called into question our ability to live by that creed. The jokes were cruel, leveling charges that NASA no longer had the right stuff in Tom Wolfe's elegant and memorable phrase. While such talk unfairly denigrates the many dedicated engineers and scientists and technicians who work late, I thought it was appropriate tonight to speak tonight, uh, appropriate to speak tonight about the Hubble Space Telescope for a bit. One of the greatest machines that NASA or anyone else has ever built and about our relationship with that machine and what it has taught us and taught me uh, about our universe and more importantly ourselves. Now this coming October astronauts on board Space Shuttle Atlantis will rendezvous with Hubble to repair it and upgrade it for the fifth time in its nearly two decades of service. I think you all know that. It's hard to read a paper without knowing that we are going to do that. It was somewhat controversial at NASA when I came on board and I settled that controversy. Um, now when they leave, um, it'll be better than ever. It will be better, in fact, than anyone ever imagined that it might be. Back when I was working on the Hubble project 25 years ago, we never imagined that it would be what it is today or what it is going to be after this fifth servicing mission. And the story of this scientific and engineering marvel is one of, of bold vision, vision and imagination, and absolutely audacious risk-taking. But it's also a story of perseverance and ingenuity, when, as sometimes happens, the risks that you take are not always successfully negotiated. It is a story that transcends science, with Hubble images on display today in art museums or in homes where no scientist lives. But we all know that the images are far more than just a bunch of pretty pictures. 
Hubble has observed the birth and death of stars, not unlike our own solar system. It has shown the collision of the comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 with the planet Jupiter, not unlike the asteroid collision 65 million years ago that wiped out the dinosaurs, which then roamed the Earth. It has peered through a tiny knothole in the night sky, deep into the early universe, finding thousands of galaxies where our own eyes would only see a patch of darkness. It has found that the galaxies in our universe are accelerating away from each other at a rate faster than any astrophysicist, including Edwin Hubble, ever predicted, allowing new insights into the birth and eventual fate of our universe while raising new mysteries about dark matter and dark energy, constituents of a universe that, in all humility, astrophysicists today must admit that we barely understand. Hubble has become a cultural icon while at the same time remaining an instrument of fundamental scientific discovery. It is unique in human history in its ability to occupy a place of prominence in both art museums and scientific journals. The birth of the Hubble Space Telescope and its launch in April 1990 would not have caused anyone to envision this outcome. Indeed, Hubble's first images were un unaccountable Thanks, Ken. Um, I, I don't think Ken should be allowed to get out of the room without uh, my recognizing that he is, uh, was announced today as the recipient of the Engelmore Award for Contributions in Artificial Intelligence. And I'm <laughs> uh, it's a very big deal in that field, possibly the biggest deal. And um, I'm very proud to have you on our NASA Advisory Council. Thanks for taking the time to do it for us. So, um, I'm often, uh, it's often remarked on that uh, uh, one of my characteristics is a certain candor, that's the nice phrase, bluntness is, is <laughs> the other phrase. And it's, it's remarked on as, um, as if I had a choice. Uh, I, I don't really know how to do any differently, so I hope I will be, um, interesting tonight and that candor will not go over the line to bluntness, but I'll, I'll do my best. So I do want to